Hello. Um, nice to see all of you. <laughs> well, I'm not, I'm not used to doing this sort of thing. So I made a, a quick outline. This is a, this is a subject that, oh, I could, I could talk for days and days about and uh, never get bored talking about it. And I know that we've only got about, about an hour together and I want to save time for any questions that folks might have. So we'll just see how far we get. And um, I think the way I'd like to, I'd like to start is I'd like to show a, a quick little video that was made from our last kiln firing. So you can sort of see a little bit of the sights and sounds of what, what's going on as a, you know, part of training in uh, Zen with ceramics. Okay, so here's a, you know, you know, a quick, quick little video that uh, that's from our last kiln firing. very calm firing. It's very easy to control.
Ken. Ken. Pat. No. Oh. There we go. Oh, yeah. Yay. Yay. Congratulations. Let's hear it for the kiln master. Yeah. 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 Scott. Okay. Outstanding. Right. Good job. Very so now we're going to uh, brick them up. Yep. Okay, so there's, there's uh, you know, kind of one of those key moments in training with ceramics. As you can see, it's a, a deeply physical training. A lot of wood to be split, doors open and closed, the sensitivity and awareness of the kiln and what's going on inside of it. And, you know, it's just kind of like the dr dramatic ending. And it's... Uh, you know, it's kind of surprising, you know, just like in our, our training, it's like sometimes what comes out, we aren't expecting. And, and it, you know, it doesn't matter we're training in calligraphy, you know, cooking, you know, you know, ceramics is definitely one of those things. It's just sort of like when you're done, it's sort of like, wow. It's like, it's like that, it's so much more going on than what, that wasn't just me. There's, there's so much more, the trees, the wood, the food being fed to the work crews. There's like so much that goes into as a team effort. And what, what comes out is pretty magnificent, quite surprising sometimes. A lot of it gets thrown away. But so here's, here's um, you know, that last, that firing, you know, so here's a, just the day that you know, it cools down enough that you can open it and you unload that kiln is just such a, such a delight to see what, what came of it. So training ceramics is, is, is kind of interesting in that, you know, so much of Zen training, you know, if you're training with a sword, you know, doing okyo, you know, what you do exists in that moment only. And there's oftentimes not a, something physical that you can hold or touch afterwards. Ceramics is, is different in that way. And that at the, at the end of the, the training, you have all these pieces and the, uh, you know, it's like good, pretty, like it or not, you know, that's, that's what came out. And uh, whereas, you know, with a sword cut, what comes out, if it's not a good sword cut, it's just sort of like, it's gone. You don't have to worry about it. And then if it's a good one, it's still gone. Uh, training ceramics is like, there's a little, when you're done, there's a lot of not good pieces that have to be just sort of like, oh, that was a failure. You know, it was loaded in the kiln the wrong place or, but, but you get to kind of look back at it and be like, oh, wow. Okay. That's, that's interesting. That's what happened. You know, so here's another, here's a, you know, teacup. And uh, let's see, let's see if I can stop sharing. There we go. So, so here's my, you know, I started uh, training in ceramics. Do my memories not that sharp? <laughs> it was, I don't know, uh, maybe um, 10, 10, 11 years ago. I'm, I'm not sure. But I was uh, very lucky to be, to have met, you know, this, this group of uh, people that were all training in Zen and uh, very lucky to have a time in my life where I was able to set aside, you know, substantial chunks of 
of time on a regular basis for you know in-depth training to have times where I could just devote myself to training. And uh, I don't remember, it was, I think it was um, out at Spring Green and uh, I took like a month or so off and we spent a lot of time working on building the dojo out there and working on the grounds. And uh, there was a particular session that really things shifted for me in a, in a very dramatic way where I had a, you know, a real strong sense that there was, this was not a waste of my time and that I needed to go deeper and devote, you know, more time to really delve into this suspicion of, of, you know, what is that? What is that? And I remember talking to uh, Green Roshi, who was my teacher, and uh, just really telling him, like, I, it's like, I need more. <laughs> I need more. I need more of this. And I, I don't know his logic, his thinking behind it. I know he probably could definitely use the help out there at Spring Green building the house and construction. But he said, okay, well, I'm going to send you to Hawaii and you're going to train in ceramics. And I was like, okay. And, uh, and that's how it was. It was not my decision. It was my teacher just told me like, I think ceramics is a match for you do this. And, and I was, I had seen enough of the training that the decisions I was making in my own life, really not always turning out that great. And I, and I definitely trusted my teacher enough that I was like, well, I haven't been making good decisions in my life. Let's hope that he, <laughs> I'll trust this guy. And uh, yeah, it, it was a, a, a truly pivotal, life-changing experience for me. So I packed my bags and flew out to Hawaii. And I can't, I can't remember. It wasn't, it wasn't like a real, you know, real long time out there. Um, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I've lived out there for years. I think it was only like two or three months that I devoted myself to be out there. And, you know, it, it was, like I said, it was like, I learned a lot in a short period of time. It's one of those things where, you know, you could show up, you know, to weekly, you know, I'd train, I, at that time, I'd already been training for, you know, I don't know, probably about 10 years in Aikido and different martial arts, very, very seriously. And we know, and we know that model of showing up every single day to class and training like one or two classes and you just, you know, every day, every day, every, every, every day. And, and still it doesn't feel like you really make that huge amount of progress. And training in Zen is like pretty amazing. It's one of those, you know, those few things where if you really want to dive in deep and, and devote serious amounts of time to it, it's like, it's one of those things where you can learn so much in a couple months, much more than you would from years and years and years of constant training. It's like that, that com, 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 committing yourself fully to something from the moment you wake up to the moment you just fall asleep. You know, it's just like everything you got working on something. And when I, my, my ceramics teacher was Clyde, Clyde Nita. And I, I learned, a, I learned a, a great deal from him in regarding, you know, how, how to train, not just train in clay, but just how to train in, in Zen in general. And I remember 
he's like, you know, one of the things he's just sort of like, you know, just, just be honest with yourself. He's like, I remember he was kind of teaching me the techniques and how to throw. And, and he's like, he's like, you know, if it's, if it's garbage, just smash it down. It's like, yeah, it's no good. It's no good. You know, don't lie to yourself. It's no, if it's no good, it's no good. And if it, if it's something really good, he'd say, oh, save it. I'll, I'll, and let me look at it. And usually I'd be like, oh, this is good. And I'd show it to me like, oh, no, that's, that's no good. <laughs> and I, I, I remember, uh, you know, a very distinct memory of, of, it was like, you know, clay comes, typically you buy it in these 30 pound bags, you know, it's about, you know, this wide, this square, and, you know, about this tall, big 30 pound heavy bag of clay. And I'm, 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 I'm pretty sure that I, I, I just would cut up that bag of clay, wedge it up into, you know, four or five pound balls of clay, and I'd throw them all into bowls. And then I just take them and wedge them right down. And I do it again day and day, day over, day over. It probably like re-wedged and re-thrown that same bag of clay uh, every single day for, for like a whole month. And, uh, and it was like, I can't, you know, I can't say that a lot of the pieces, you know, most of the pieces really weren't very good. But every now and then something, something would happen where it'd just be like, boom, it's sort of like, wow. It's like, it felt like I didn't, I didn't do that. And uh, it's really one of the, you know, some of the things that I learned at my time training in the clay was, you know, if you really want something bad enough, you know, you, you don't need any encouragement. You know, in fact, if encouragement is part of that requirement, it's like, mm -mm. it's like, I definitely didn't get any encouragement or I don't think the whole time I was there, I'm pretty sure not a single person ever said like, oh, pretty good. That was nice. It's like, nope. It's just like, nope, try harder, try harder. And, you know, just like the value of relentlessly pursuing something. Uh, it's just pretty universally applicable. And something that I don't think I really appreciated that much before training in ceramics. So, so I definitely trained very relentlessly in, in, in ceramics and clay when I, was, when I was living in out there. Some of the lessons learned that, you know, I, I remember uh, when I started training, there was kind of a, almost like a catchphrase that a lot of my teachers would say. And it was, Kiai first, Kiai first. And I, I, I at first taught, thought that that was just like, oh yeah, ki first, like, like your effort, like the energy, like what you put into something. It was like, I thought that, you know, if you would just like put, go, go, go. It's like, whatever you do, just put, it'll, it'll be okay. It'll turn out, it'll turn out. But like, not always so, right? It's like, uh, it's like, you know, ki first, in regards to like, in matter of importance, like putting your effort into it is like very important. But in terms of like actual execution, it's like ma'ai first. So there's ki'ai and ma'ai. And ma'ai is kind of more like the form or the technique or the you know, time and space relationship of things and the, the techniques. And it's like, so, Pretty, pretty big lesson. I mean, for you guys, you're probably like, oh, duh. Yeah, of course. But, you know, for me, I, I was really kind of like, just whatever, just put everything you got into it and you'll figure it out. It's like, no, actually, like, if you want to learn, if you want to train in swordsmanship, like, actually learn the proper way to hold a sword. Or if you're going to train in kudo, like, actually know how to hold a bow. If you're throwing clay, you know, there's actual techniques for, like, how to wedge the clay properly so that you get the air out. And then once you've got those techniques, then don't hold back, put everything you got into it. And that was a, that was a very big shift in, uh, for me uh, that I learned through, 
through ceramics and clay. It's just sort of like, you know, figure out how to do things the right way, you know, find someone who knows better or who like might hint, hint you in the right direction. But, but, uh, but even those techniques, it's like, you know, another, you know, even those techniques. So I could watch uh, Clyde, you know, center clay. I could see him make an opening and, and pull up a cylinder. And there's no amount of ex explanation that he was capable or uh, he didn't even try. He, he knew better, but there's no, there's no amount of explanation that he could, you know, do out of his mouth or even doesn't matter how many times he could show me something. It's like, it was no point talking about it. Right. It's like, he can be like, eh, it looks like, you know, not good. You're going in the right direction. Keep trying that. It was really just like, just through sheer repetition of failing again and again and again and again. And then those few moments were all of a sudden like, Oh, not a failure what happened there and to try and figure it out you know there's no way to explain like the viscosity of a cl of clay there's no way to describe you know how the speed of the wheel spinning has an effect on the rate of of pulling or how hard you can push a clay now these are things to be you know experienced and that's really you know these are these a lot of the techniques can't really actually be taught is that they have to be they have to be discovered you know on your own and you can have a, a you know someone like point you in the right direction and that's that's very much true with you know all aspects of training in zen so we've all had explanations of how to sit zazen on a cushion how to breathe from the hara but there's no amount of explanation that any teacher, anyone can have that they can give you that'll automatically make you breathe from your hara. It's like you have to be the one to relentlessly pursue those techniques. It's a, it's a hungry search. And it's true with working with clay as it is sitting zazen. You know, the particular way of like, what's the perfect way that the chin is tucked and how is it related to the shoulders? And how does the breath relate to that? And how is, what's the perfect curvature of the spine in order to really tap into and lower your breathing? Because it has to be a, it, there's fine technique, every aspect of that, it can't be taught. You have to relentlessly pursue that and search for my eye search for the technique. And as soon as something locks in and you're sort of like, oh, that's different. What is that? Okay, that's when Kiai first, go for it. So that's why, you know, it's just like, I can, I can still hear Clyde. All he would say is like, oh, make, make, make lots, make lots. And so training in uh, Zen through ceramics really kind of looks like a production potter. It's not an art class. It's not, we're not here to express ourselves or be creative. It's, it's, it's deep physical training. You know, some fundamental principles are available to be unlocked that are universally applicable every aspect of your life. And so that's why it's like, it's like, there's, there's kind of, you know, my, my teacher was like this and I, and I'm, I'm with the people that learn from me It's sort of, you know, green Roshi is it, it said it the best is like, let's not even talk about it until you've thrown a couple thousand cups. It's like, because unless you, unless you've really put the time in and trying to figure out the techniques, it's just empty discussion. It's just, it's all it is is words. So it takes a lot of effort to really dive in. So 
yeah, kind of like quantity over quality in, in a lot of ways. And the, and the funny thing is, is that actually quantity brings about a lot of quality. So after, uh, after, you know, I'll bring this up. This is um, very interesting article was sent to me after I, I lived in, in Hawaii and trained in ceramics. Um, Krishna Roshi's son, Andrew and I are, you know, good friends. I still enjoy his company very much. And he sent me an article about um, an, like an art class, some sort of article. And I read that article and I was really fascinated by it. And I read it and I researched it some more. And the article was referencing a, a very particular book that um, I don't know if, if, if you guys have heard of, it's maybe popular, it's maybe well known, but it's called Art, art and Fear. And it's a, it's a book that was you know, written by, I guess, kind of like two uh, art, art teachers it's called, called Observations on the Perils and Rewards of you know, Making Art. And basically, the book is a story about talking about uh, a ceramics program, a ceramics teacher who tried an experiment in their class. And I'm going to just read, um, read some of the synapses here. He said, the teachers divided the students into two groups. Those sitting on the left side of the studio were graded solely on the quality of their work. And those on the right were solely on the quantity of work. The instructors informed the students on the quality group that simple rule would be applied to evaluate their grades. Those who produced 50, found 50 pounds of pots would get it grade A. Like if you would just crank out a lot of ceramics, you get an A. If you pronounce this much, B. If you pronounce this much, C. So it's just like strictly on quant quantity. And then for the quality group, the instructor told the students that they would assign the course grades based on the single best piece. So you could spend the entire semester, just make one piece, and we'll just, we'll, or you could make three, whatever, and we'll just take the best one, and that's what your grade is. And that produced over the duration of the co course. So if a student just created a single first-rate pot on the first day, they didn't have to do a single thing for the rest of the term. They would just get an A. And then when the end of the quarter arrived and it came to grading, the instructors made a very interesting discovery. The students created the best work as judged by technical and artistic sophistication where, you know, well, basically it was the, quant the quantity group. It was the people that just cranked out a lot of clay and just spent a lot of time and a lot of repetition had a much more artistic refinement much more high quality and just a much more higher level of proficiency. So, you know, even if we're not talking about, you know, Zen training and, and, and why we train, even just from like a production potter sort of standpoint, you know, it's sometimes just quantity over quality. Um, you know, yeah, so, so other lessons learned. It was a sort of like <laughs> another deep lesson learned in my time there was, was that, you know, the only one, for a lot of, a lot of the, lot, for the most part, the only one holding you back is yourself. It was like every single time that I got tired or I got frustrated, I got exhausted, and I wasn't actually putting every bit of ounce of effort in it, this this was usually the reason why it was it was me it was usually all the excuses that i'd make up um you know it's like it's like you know we wake up you know the life of a live-in pretty strenuous you know we'd wake up every day at about i can't remember <laughs> I'm, not, I'm trying to remember. I think it's like wake up at five, the gate unlocks at 5.30. You sit, you know, do zazen, breakfast. When I was living in, 
we'd keep on getting these massive dump truck loads of rocks. And uh, another live-in and I, Zach and I, were living in together. And all day long, we'd just like lift up these big rocks and we'd build all these big rock walls around the, uh, the Kudo Dojo and the, and the main Budo Dojo, mixing a lot of concrete you know, with our hands. Fingers would just be all cracked and bleeding. And then it'd be like, okay, time to throw clay. And just like, throw clay. And it's like, you know, my fingers were just bleeding all the time. They just hurt. But it's like, you know, how, how bad do you want this? How bad do you want to figure things out? It's, like, it's easy to make, mis- make, uh, make up excuses like, oh, my fingers hurt. Oh, I'm bleeding. Oh, I can't, I can't throw. It's like, I'm fine. You know, <laughs> I'm fine. But it was like every time, it was like sort of like, oh, do I really want to just like sit this one out? It was like, no. It was like every single time, the reason holding back. This is another thing I really love about Zen, Zen training. You know, it's like, I know, I know we're supposed to like, oh yeah, yeah, really put effort into, you know, whatever you do. But there's, there's really not a lot of outlets in our daily life where you can really, really throw yourself 100%. Every ounce of you got at every moment, and it's actually appropriate. And, it can, and it's, you know, if it looks ugly, okay, you got, try it again, try it again. You know, it's like, you know, the equivalent of, of, like, of that would be like if you went grocery shopping and you're like, screaming on the top of your lungs, pushing the car like, ah, and just like grabbing the groceries and throw it, you know, just like, you know, it's like, you know, and like not being able to like, not like, don't hold back. It's like, there's, there's almost, there's almost no example of that in our daily life where that's appropriate. It's like training in Zen, expected expected you know it's like if you you know you go to you go to a session you go to a formal training you know it's like oh time for san zen ding and everyone's like ah like you know running it's just like everything they got get into line you know like when you're eating just like ah, eat the food you know put everything you got into it it's pretty ridiculous but it's so much fun it's like, I, you know, we're, we're beings that we've just been getting held back for too long. There's, there's, there's not many, it feels so good. And if you're not doing that every day, it's like we're not living close to our potential. And, you know, it's like, yeah, it's, it's a venue, it's a space. This is, this is why a dojo or a Zen temple is such a special place. It's one of those, you know, very rare places where not holding back, you know, putting every ounce of what you've got into it is appropriate, not just appropriate, expected. So that was another great thing. And another, I would say another, you know, big lesson that I, that I kind of, that I learned, you know, and I think a lot of that was because of being able to put my whole being into what I was doing. And, and I think it's also because of like, oh, being really tired and a lot of times not I'm like, ah, I think I've had enough, you know, it's like, you know, but, but constantly just being like, nope, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. And, and I'm also very thankful of, of my teachers, not really like saying, oh, come on, Scott, let's do this, come on. You know, like there's, you know, no coaxing. No, no like trying to hold my hand and like, oh, it's okay, we're gonna do this. You know, cause it's like, you know, that would have kind of, you know, robbed me of having great adversity. Cause you know, great adversity, you know, great barriers, great, you know, something to really push up against you know, requires great effort. And putting great effort into something, 
you know, that, you know, generates great ki. It generates a great inner strength, you know. So the 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 work of training in Zen, you know, it's like it's spiritual forging. You know, right to the core. Spiritual forging. You know, we're not just making pots. You know, it's like we're we're recreating not just ourselves, we're recreating the, the entire world through the training. And that takes great effort. And it kind of clears things out. And when you're used to, when you learn, you know, there's like not many, there's not many good venues of learning how to apply great effort in an efficient manner, in an effective manner. in a clear manner that comes out appropriately. There's not, there's not a lot of like, you know, good venues for that. Zen training is a very good venue for that. And, and when you put great effort into what you do and you put a lot of energy into what you do, what comes out is, is quite different. It's like it has like it's like in uh, in calligraphy they they describe it as you know bulky right so bulky is like the ki in the ink so with you know if, if you're just all comfortable and you're just sitting there and like da 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 just kind of like art class with with a brush right there's not real strong depth to the ink it doesn't have you know with someone else in engages with it, it doesn't really have a huge impact on them, or at least not to someone who's sensitive to it. But with great adversity and just like with a lot of practice, you know, it, sh it comes through, it comes through and is embedded in what you do. Everything you do, what you, the effort you put into it is embedded into it. And if you just kind of put a weak effort into things, it has a real weak, muddled feeling. If you put great effort to do things in a very clear, straightforward manner, it comes out in a clear way. And, you know, so in calligraphy, it's called, you know, bulky. In clay, it's called doki. And doki is, you know, comes from the Japanese do and ki. So do is uh, you know, kind of like dirt or clay or earth, and a key, like energy, your ki. And, and it, it's, it's, it, it, can't, it can't be faked. It's, it's not like a technique to make things look clear. It's just, it's just either you put everything you got into it or you don't. And when you, when you do, it has great do key. And, and when that happens, you know, the, the, the pieces that come out, it's, like, it's not like you're trying to make those pieces. It's more like that's the result of your training. And when someone else picks up that piece, you know, eats oatmeal or, or whatever out of it, it, you know, even if they're not the person that threw it, it has an effect on them. It, 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 it has a bigger effect than just you. So... So those are some of the, the lessons that I, I learned, you know, while training in ceramics uh, at my time in Hawaii. And like, wow, <laughs> I could talk about this all day. I got like pages and we've only, we've only gone like, like a quarter of the way through, uh, through my, my outline. I have all these like other videos and I was gonna do a demonstration and it's just, it's just, there's just not enough time. There's just not enough time. So um, we've got about like 15 minutes. So I guess we'll just we'll just leave it leave it at that. And uh, does if anyone has any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. Oh yeah, hey Gina. 
Thank you very much for that. Very, um, very inspirational to hear mm. your experience. How often do you train in ceramics now with uh, COVID? Mm, mm. I, I took a, I took a pretty big break there for a while. So I, so I'm uh, here in the, the basement. This is our ceramics. I'll give you guys a, you know, some here. There's a, there's some wheels right here. And so I'm, I'm here in the basement of uh, Daiko Zenji here in, here in uh, Madison. And you can also see on the other side, there's a bunch of doors and there's some building supplies. There's a slab roller, you know, there's Peter. <laughs> so I, I've been spending a great deal of my time um, uh, working on construction to trying to get things far enough along that we can, we can like start using the space. Um, but I'd say probably, so I, I took a kind of a break from daily, from regular training, but the kind of the short answer is, is like for the last like month or so, I've been training every Friday. So pretty much every Friday come down here, we sit Zazen, we do some stretching and then we, we throw, we throw, uh, ceramics for, you know, a couple hours until about like nine o'clock and then we clean up and then uh, come back. Saturday morning and uh, uh, sit Zazen and then we trim and we load up the kiln. So, so right now we, I'm training on a, a regular basis, on a weekly basis, and we're getting ready for another firing. So we got another firing coming up here in May. So motivated to get more pieces to load up the kiln and have another full load. So any, any other questions? Yep. Hey, Kelly. Hi, thank you so much. I appreciated so much your presentation. Um, I got to go to also to Hawaii, but only for two weeks, but I was training in ceramics probably half the day for all of those days, trying to like, <laughs> like you say, do the volume and, you know, figure out what I could through the, through the practice and the volume. Oh. But for me, the, um, there was something very, very remarkable about finally learning how to center the clay on the wheel, which of course is like the first kind of thing you have to do, right? But it took me so long to be able to just make that stick and then um, center it, right? And, and then I, but I, but everything depended on getting that clay centered. Because if it was just off a little, later on as you're pulling, it's like hopeless, right? And so, um, but, and you said you practice Aikido as, and, and I do as well. And I was practicing Aikido there. So I, I finally took that centering. I could take it, I learned how to center on the wheel. I learned how to center in Aikido. <laughs> so it was so transferable, I guess is my point. And it's so remarkable to have that in Aikido, centering, you know, you sort of in and out and grounding yourself and especially at my level, low level. But I had this something very, very physical, a whole body experience to go back to after centering the clay on the wheel. And I, I still forever can go back to that. It's like my home base. And so I just was, it was remarkable, short time, small experience, but like lifelong, aha, there was a big aha, there was a boom that happened with that. Uh, even, it's not even like doing ceramics, this is like the first piece, right? <laughs> so. and, well, there's, no, there's no way that anyone could have spoken words to you to, right? You had to discover that technique. And it's not just a technique with clay when it's a, when it's a fundamental principle, it's universally applicable. And, and this is where like a fine art and a martial art together I had the same experience. So after learning, it was like, so uh, Clyde trained in intense martial arts for many, many years. And uh, like we, we our, our training in clay was kokyodoso, you know, kokyodosa, where the pushing exercise, like, it's like, nope. And then 
try it with the wheel, try it with the clay. We do back and forth, back and forth. And we do pushing exercises and like swinging swords and like, you know, all this sort of stuff. And same experience, like after experiencing that in the wheel, then experiencing that like in Aikido, many experiences is like, oh, there's the center. And then all of a sudden it feels like throwing someone feels like just like falling into a hole, right? It's just like, boom, there it is. It's like no effort. So it's like, wow, was that always there? Yeah, it was. It's just like you're never aware of it. Oh, that's so wonderful. Yeah, that's so cool. Wow. Any, anyone else? Any other questions? Okay. Well, I just, uh, I just, yeah. I want to ask a question. Okay. I wonder, I wonder for anybody who's curious, um, are you starting to take new students in terms of training in ceramics or what are the requirements at this point? Yeah. So we're, we're, we're taking new students, but for the, depending upon, you know, it's like everyone is different, right? The goal, the goal isn't to make beautiful pots or beautiful bowls. This is, this is not our motivation. It's like if bo beautiful bowls and pots get made, great. But like, I, I have zero concern about having a lot of like 50 plates, you know, hundred bowls. It's, it's really the, the physical work of, of getting into the body and how we do that and, and learning some of these, you know, fundamental principles and, and learning, I'd say really learning how to effectively train in Zen so that our time on the cushion or time is like, we want to cut that down to a minimum. We want to, we want to like figure things out. We want to get the techniques. It's like, we can just sit on a cushion for years and years, but if you don't have anything really significant shift, it's like, come on, maybe try something else. And, and it's really more, more about where you are in your training. And it's really getting to know what's, how do we make something shift? How do we access some of these principles in order to, how do we get you to learn how to hunt and find it on your own? Because there's no explanation. There's no talks that we can get that you're going to learn it. And, you know, for most people, I would say, you know, a lot of that you can, you can learn much more effectively or get at least a, a really good grounding in a martial art. So for the most part, most people, anyone that is interested in training in Zen, the way I would start, you know, I would get to know them and probably a good way to start would be like Hojo. Hojo is a sword class. And so actually, if you want to train in Zen, I wouldn't put clay in your hands right away. I mean, with ceramics, I'd be like, no, train in ceramics with a wooden sword or, you know, hojo walk. It's like, get into your body. Let's get this. And there's a lot of these principles about how, like how to train in Zen. There's all these ways that we have that are very effective for learning about, you know, learning about breath and posture and hara. And then once you sort of play with it, that, okay, now we go to the clay, you know, now we try and figure it out, you know, you know, you know, someone like Kelly, who's already trained in Aikido for many years, you know, probably very quickly with, you know, pushing exercises and, you know, hojo walk and breathing exercises with a sword. Who knows? Maybe it'd be very like, oh, yep, let's get this girl dirty. But, you know, most people, um, you know, really like hojo walk, breathing with a sword, some really, you can, things are much more accessible that way. And so typically most people are expected to train in one of our martial arts, Hojo, Kendo, Kudo, some, something for at least a few months. And once someone feels like, you know, this is like a commitment, all right, let's take it deeper. Let's, let's take it and let's, let's try training in ceramics. I think it's not everyone we would start with uh, training in clay because it's what we're trying to figure out I think there's a much other, much more effective ways to figure out than with, with clay, but, but for multiple approaches is like, you know, we want to make things shift. We want to make things 
happen. We want to make things open up. Any, uh, any other questions? Yep, yep. Hey, Kelly. Hey, I just, uh, Heather's question and your response made me remember um, just that uh, it was very, that the letting go of the aesthetic, like I had no, I mean, I, I enjoy pottery or I, you know, appreciate pottery, but I didn't know what I was doing until like, even like having to break your work that you worked so hard on, like there's pieces of it to help for me to help me let go of that, um, I don't know, the aesthetic. And mm -hmm. then, but that was key to being able to do the work or to do the training for me anyways. I don't know if it's for everybody, but I, I know that I could see other people too, like really interested in what, oh, what's been created. Oh, that's, you know, but uh, Norma Wong Roshi was there and the way she would just, um, give feedback about the pieces. And then um, I got the privilege of sitting through one of her viewings where she would take different pieces and she would describe, um, you know, what she was, I don't know, seeing or sensing in it. Mm. And it was, and it was just like, whoa, it was like a whole nother world got opened to see what is she, what is she, seeing, feeling, noticing, like, what is it, you know, this then in the key eye, right? So how does, how do you, yeah, how, how do you, like, it was just a whole other dimension for me opened up about it beyond the aesthetic. And it's like the aesthetic was nothing after a glimpse of yeah. something else, which I think is the key eye, I guess with my. <laughs> yeah, and the amazing thing is, is, you know, Wang Roshi, did not train in ceramics, but she's trained, you know, very deeply in, in, in other ways. And, and then through those learning those, those deeper principles, you can, it's, it's everywhere. And so even though she's not like, you know, you probably wouldn't want her to show you how to throw the technical aspects of throwing a pot, but she has a real sensitivity that it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you know once you once you see this or sense that in a in a pot you know you can see that in, in someone's cooking you can taste it you know it's 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 all over yeah yeah oh that's so cool you have, you have had such a wonderful wonderful experience that's you know very precious so um well it's about the end of uh, the, the allotted time. And I want to be respectful of your bedtime. And uh, it was uh, a pleasure rambling on a little bit. Again, this is something that I, you know, there, should, there better be a cutoff time. Otherwise I can, I could just go, all, I could go for days about this. Um, but it's, you know, it's just, it's just words. Much more better to, to train. So with that, Thank you and have a good night.